With the collapse of the USSR, some countries adopted democracy, while others fell into authoritarianism. However, Tajikistan fell into chaos. Hello, I am your host David, and this is Eurasia. Without further ado, let's talk about the Tajikistani civil war right now. The Tajik SSR, located on the fringes of the USSR on the border with China and Afghanistan, was likely the one republic least affected by Moscow since its inclusion into the Russian Empire and the USSR soon thereafter. The Tajik SSR, and later Tajikistan, is a geographical nightmare for empires as well as itself. Thus, before talking about the civil war, it's important to discuss Tajikistan's geography and demography. To the north, the conflict-prone Fergana Valley and Tajikistan's second largest city, Khojant, lie in Tajikistan's Sugud Oblast. To the southwest, the Khatlon and Republican Subordination Oblast, where the largest city and capital of Tajikistan, Dushanbe, is located, creates a flat and relatively easily passable land between Tajikistan and its western neighbor Uzbekistan, as well as its southern border with Afghanistan. Yet, splitting the north and the south is the Gisan and Zhirovan Mountains. Only one road connects these two oblasts, though more are planned in the future. Then, to the east is the Gorono Badakhstan Oblast. This oblast is notorious for its beautiful nature and mountain range called the Pamirs. But the Pamirs have facilitated a culture of self sustainability from the local Pamiris, as well as being near impossible to navigate through. In each of these three regions, the North, South, and the Pamirs, there is a unique identity that each has. Thus, despite being the smallest country in Central Asia, Tajikistan has a very diverse and difficult geography to overcome. It thus played a huge part in the Tajikistani civil war. Coinciding with Gorbachev's ascension to power and the ensuing policies of Perestroika and Glasnost, the people of Tajikistan were ready to leave the USSR. Moreover, in the south and Pamirs, people were ready to destroy communism for good in Tajikistan. Separately, however, ethnic tensions tore the south and the Pamirs apart. Both were becoming more ethnocentric towards Tajiks and Pamir people respectively. In 1985, Rahmon Nabiyev, the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Tajik SSR and a native of Khojant in the north, was ousted due to corruption charges. The southern and Pamiri people, eager for change, became outraged when a Khojant native and member of the Communist Party, Kahor Makhamov, succeeded him. Backed by Moscow, Makhamov was given the resources to prevent any potential coup or violence in the country. However, with Perestroika and Glasnost in full effect by 1989, Moscow lost de facto control of Tajikistan. On February 12th to 14th of 1990, the nationalist fervor resulted in the 1990 Dushanbe riots where, after hearing that Moscow sent Armenian refugees to Dushanbe, ethnic-centric Tajiks looked to hunt down Armenians and Russians alike. By the end of the riots, 26 were dead. Mohamov and his prime minister submitted their resignation due to this, but it was not accepted. However, in August of 1991, News came out that Mohamov supported the August coup against Mikhail Gorbachev. On August 31st of 1991, Mohamov retired from the Tajik presidency that had only been replaced by the first secretaryship a month prior. Mohamov's successor, Kadridin Aslanov, would only hold the presidency for 23 days. But in those 23 days, Aslanov would do many things, including leading the Tajik SSR as it declared its sovereignty from the Soviet Union on September 9th of 1991. Aslanov's quick and rash decisions would have him himself ousted from the presidency on September 23rd, 1991. The Communist Party, still not dissolved despite Aslanov's attempts as well as Tajikistan's newfound independence, would put Rahmon Nabiyev back into leadership. By this time, Southerners and the citizens of the Pamirs were completely disgusted. Mohamov, Aslanov, and Nabiyev were all northerners, Khojant natives, and the Communist Party members. Through all of this, neither southerners nor the people of the Pamirs had any voice. However, 
A glimmer of hope postponed the violence when Nabiyev was peacefully ousted from power only two weeks after being in office. Nabiyev's successor, Akbar Shoh Iskandarov, was a southerner who many in the south trusted. Iskandarov wished for a democratic state to be created in Tajikistan and, thus, called for elections on November 24, 1991. He himself was not a candidate. However, a familiar face was a candidate. Rahmon Nabiyev would run for the presidency in 1991. With 57% of the votes, Nabiyev won and assumed power of the country for the third time on December 2, 1991. The southerners and people of the Pamirs had had enough. Small guerrilla fighters popped up in the south and began fighting the government by the end of the year. In response, Nabiyev supplied pro-government militias with guns to fight the fighters. By February of 1991, the unorganized guerrilla fighters began to organize. By April, the country was split in two. In May, after guerrilla fighters and the government forces clashed, the Tajikistani civil war officially started. After the original clash, the country split into two. Pro-government forces, mostly located in the north as well as the center of Dushanbe, were colloquially known as Lenin baddies, after the old Soviet name for Khojan. The anti-government forces, mostly located in the south, were called the United Tajik Opposition, or UTO for short. As probably obvious, the multiple original militias that sprang up after the election all had their own motives and desires. Though they were all united under the UTO, the militias consisted of far-left sympathizers, democratic supporters, regional independent supporters, and Islamic extremists. With the capital located in the south, the UTO was able to overwhelm the Tajik government quickly. On September 7, 1992, less than four months after the breakout of the war, Dushanbe fell to the UTO, and Nabiyev was forced at gunpoint to resign. Before this, many politicians were captured and forced to dissolve the government. The UTO thus created a coalition government. However, as expected, the diverse sets of factions disagreed on many things and therefore were extremely disorganized and ineffective. The UTO lost Dushanbe by the end of 1992 because of two new players to the civil war, Uzbekistan and Russia. Russia and Uzbekistan, who had loosely supported the North both with materials and direct fighting, had taken the responsibility of protecting the Afghan-Tajik and Uzbek-Tajik border after the collapse of the USSR. The UTO did not retaliate, knowing the power of both. However, now they had nothing more to lose, and the UTO was now directly fighting three governments as well as many more indirectly. Most notably, the Islamic extremists, who were mostly located in the Pamir region, used the rough and mountainous terrain in their favor to smuggle weapons across the border, especially after the Taliban had gained more control in Afghanistan. As the war dragged on, the extremists grew further and further apart from the rest of the UTO. In December of 1992, the parliament of Tajikistan, still named the Supreme Soviet, appointed a new president, Imam Ali Rahmanov. Rahmanov continues to lead the country till this day, but the civil war was far from over. Rahmanov, though not a native of the north, was still a Communist Party member, and thus was yet another reason for the UTO to believe that still, their voices had not been heard. Despite being outnumbered, outgunned, and having no chance at winning, the UTO fought on. As the Rahmanov-led government pushed back the United Tajik opposition, the UTO started to dissolve, but the individual militias stayed intact. The war went from a conventional war to a guerrilla war, resembling that which we see in Afghanistan today. The fighting lasted four years, where many atrocities would be committed. The loosely organized UTO indiscriminately killed anyone remotely related to the government, while the Rahmanov government killed many minority groups in the south. Human Rights Watch has even called Rahmanov's actions an attempted genocide against the local Pamiri and Garmi people. During this time too, Rahmanov would crack down on freedom of speech and press. Dozens of journalists were killed yearly. All along, however, the United Nations was trying deeply to stop the war. Russia, the main decider in UN interference, 
finally brokered a peace conference in 1997. Meeting in Moscow on June 26th and June 27th of 1997, Yeltsin met with Rachmanov and Saeed Abdullah Nuri, then the leader of the UTO and Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, and they brokered a peace deal. The war was finally over. The Moscow Protocol gave concessions to each side, though there are a lot more details to talk about. The protocol mainly said that Tajikistan would be a democracy where Rahmanov would become president in 1999, while the UTO is promised at least 30% of the parliamentary seats. Estimates vary, but anywhere between 25,000 and 100,000 people died because of the war between 1992 and 1997. About 800,000 people were forced to leave their homes, and another 260,000 people fled the country, especially to Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and Russia. The damage of the war is estimated at about $10 billion just between 1992 and 1993, with another couple billion dollars in damage coming every year after that. On top of this, the North seen little fighting. Thus, the South seen most of the fighting and was deeply scarred by the war while the North was relatively untouched. The peace deal was successful at its attempts to stop the fighting, but the wants and desires of the UTO were never met. In 2004, the 30% UTO held parliament seats in the Tajik government expired. Today, Rahmanov led People's Democratic Party of Tajikistan has 51 out of the 61 seats in the legislature. Rahmanov, after the 1999 elections, expanded his powers greatly. Yet this was only the start. In the 2000s, noticing the chaos their neighbors to the south were falling into, Rahmon, who had changed his last name by this time in order to remove the Russian-influenced Ov on his last name, cracked down on everything Islam-related in Tajikistan. Rahmon would ban the Azan and Namaz from playing in mosques, as well as ban beards, veils, madrasas, Islamic names, and many other Islamic things. In 2015, the Islamic Renaissance Party itself, the group which brokered the peace deal between the UTO and Tajikistan, would be outlawed. However, some may argue that Rahmon has done well for the people of Tajikistan. Violence is rare today, and cities like Dushanbe and Khujant are developing relatively quickly. On the other hand, the countryside is, in general, in terrible condition, especially in the Pamirs. Moreover, Tajikistan is today the largest receiver of remittances. Nearly 35% of the country's GDP comes from Tajik immigrants abroad. Many cities in Tajikistan see their populations decrease greatly in the summer, since many go to Russia or Kazakhstan in order to get money for the rest of the year. Thus, the Tajikistani civil war was a bloody and likely useless war between post-communist old regime supporters and varied groups all hopeful for a better post-Soviet future for the state of Tajikistan in their own individualistic way. The result of the war was a stalemate, but the ensuing years after 1997 showed that the old regime would remain in power like most of Tajikistan's neighbors. Thus, it comes at no surprise that, in 2016, Ejin Rahmon passed an amendment in order to allow people 30 or over to run for president compared to the previous 35. Conveniently, the mayor of Dushanbe will be 33 in time for the 2020 elections next year. Expectedly, the mayor of Dushanbe, Rustam Imomali, is Rahmon's son. Don't forget to click the subscribe button and of course, like the video as well. Thanks for watching and until next time, Stay happy, stay humble, stay hopeful, and goodbye.